Welcome to the Standard of Truth podcast. In this podcast, Dr. Garrett Dirkmont and Professor Richard LaDuke explore the early history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the life and teachings of Prophet Joseph Smith. They examine the original historical sources and provide context for events of the past. They approach the history of the Church with faith, expertise, and humor. Hi, welcome to another episode of the Standard of Truth podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Garrett Dirkmont, and I'm joined by my friend, Professor Richard LaDuke. Hello, Garrett. In this week's podcast, we're going to read one email and respond to its many, many, many questions and claims. Um, so it's it's rare that we just dig into one, but this one is so well written. You probably got everyone hopeful that we're going to read the CES letter. <laughs> no, not that. Huh. Not that. But uh, so this, this uh, we'll start off with the Brandon Cox, formerly Phoebe Draper mailbag, brought to you by Jersey Mike's. Um, who don't sponsor us at all? Sponsor I like all. I like how Richard at times is acting as if anyone would would spend money to sponsor us uh, for any reason. Yeah, no, it's uh, this is brought to you by Jersey Mike's and uh, Texas Roadhouse, uh, Texas Roadhouse, yeah, 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 and Walmart. Dear Doc and the Professor, so I've not written you in a while due to the fact that I am concerned to be affiliated with a money making Ponzi scheme. <laughs> That you two capitalists are now part of. Now, as we read this in the um, in the in the prep here in the show prep, yeah, the, the pre-show, which consists of Richard reading this right before I hit record. <laughs> so as as I was reading it, uh, Garrett said, "This isn't a Ponzi scheme because in a Ponzi scheme, some of the people get some money." Right. Back. The whole point of a Ponzi scheme is you take some of the money from the later investors, you give a partial return to the early investors in order to drag out the yeah. Ponzi scheme to create a sense yeah. that this is you know you're we good are returns. giving nothing, yeah, nothing to anyone. Back. Yeah, yeah. Right. This is the, so this it's more is of a Ponzi scheme. It's more of a scheme, Brandon, not yeah. a Ponzi scheme. It's more of we are a new cryptocurrency. Um, <laughs> However, however, I can no longer sit idly by. My concerns are to those of your listeners who are now several thousand dollars in debt due to betting advice, so-called. <laughs> and well, why did you well, listen no, to us? The, no, first of all. The Red Sox went. <laughs> first of all, we said the, the number came from MGM Grand, and it was take the under. Originally, I said take the over, but we corrected in that same episode, take the under on Chris Stapleton on the uh, – on the national anthem, I got a text. I got a text from Ken Go Lightly that said, "I just lost my house during the Super Bowl." I laughed out loud. Well, he should have bet his whole Ken. house. Yeah, yeah no, that's your fault. He's moving to your basement. That's right. Um, uh, betting advice: second mortgage, just to listen to the premium content as they look into their children's faces and say, "I know you're hungry, but it's either put food on the table or no." Uh, what the historical implications are of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Garrett, you want to give a, just just a couple extra tidbits on the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? Well, the historical implications are it's, it's a profound. third of the United States. Yeah, it's 55% yeah. of Mexico at the time. And a third of all U.S. territory today comes from the Mexican session, which was concluded with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, ending the Mexican War, and... Bringing Utah, California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, part of Wyoming, half of Colorado, uh, all of that into the United States as part of the as part of the session, and uh, for the grand total of uh, fifteen million dollars. And this was purchased in uh, in what was it eighteen forty eight? Eighteen forty eight. Now the interesting thing about the Treaty of Guadalupe <laughs> Hidalgo is that. <laughs> I don't know. Go apparently, ahead. Apparently, go ahead, there's try, nothing. You know, yeah. yeah go ahead. I said those words. Go Richard ahead. began laughing. Yeah, go ahead. Try. The interesting thing about it is uh, Americans liked to pay money for land that they were forcing <laughs> other people to give them. <laughs> it, it was kind of like a way to make themselves feel better. Uh, hey, you're going to give us all of this land. Well, we don't want to. Well, we're going to kill you otherwise. Okay, I guess you can have it. Here's now we want to be, we wanna be, wanna be fair. fair. This is not market value, but we want to be fair. And so that entirety of that area, including, by the way, it's actually much bigger than that because Mexico had never 
relinquished its claims to Texas. So even though Texas was an independent republic and had been, uh, you know, since the Battle of San Jacinto, I mean, it had been an independent pro- republic by the time of the Tri- Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. It had been independent for over a decade, right? Um, Mexico never recognized Texas's independent status. And so they would invade Texas occasionally. Um, and Texas gets annexed before the Mexican war. That is actually one of the reasons why the war happens. So part of the settling of the treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is that Texas's annexation by the United States is affirmed. So it's actually Texas, which is including part of Oklahoma, you know, New Mexico, part of most of Colorado, the, really half of it, part of Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and the present state of California. All of that, you know, is it impactful? That's, I mean, I, are, if you live in any of those states, I would say that it is. Yeah. So, yeah, to answer that point, Brandon, yeah, it is worth your kids not yeah. eating. I, I don't know how many people are making the decision between eating and listening to this podcast, but I'm pretty sure the number of people that are making that decision are such that we can't quantify it here. <laughs> well, so he gets to his, he gets to, uh, so the, the, su- the message or this, the subject line of the email is don't worry, I got this. And then he, he goes through and I'm going to read them here. It's, it's tremendous. He goes through and lists all of the things that we have said that we're going to say, but then never actually get to. So he, which which is the Ponzi part of the Ponzi scheme. <laughs> yeah. We continually tell people someday we're going to cover this. He even he even cites them here. All right. Oh boy. Yeah. This so is, this Mor- is a bad thing. Mormon War in Missouri, said in episodes twenty nine, Mercy Fielding Thompson Smith episode, Freemason Part One. American So we've said this a lot. American Ideology Part One, Unpublished Revelations Part Two, bl- Polygamy Kind of Part Two. So all the times we, we said we're going to bring up Mormon war in Missouri. Well, we, we've continually said we'll at some point do that. We'll get to it. Yeah. yeah right. I don't think that we've ever said we're going to do that tomorrow. We won't. We, we've consistently said part of our problem is we're not quite sure how to do it. Yeah. Is that we, the choices are make it explicit content, which we don't want to do uh, because of how graphic all of the horrors are there, or soft pedal what happened. So that it's not as graphic, and then people don't really know what happened. Plural marriage, a 37-parter, episode <laughs> 4, 28, Zion part 1, polygamy kind of part 1 and 2, uh, although he does give you some credit for addressing some of the issues. There we go. Baptism for the dead, episode 6, King Follett's sermon, episode 7 and 28. Our good friend uh, Brady has been asking for this. In yeah. fact, he, he was the... He bought all the equipment. He was the early funder of everything to get everything set up only so that Garrett would do it. Garrett did one episode. We never published it. <laughs> yeah, outside of these mics, right? Lisa did buy these mics for us, which... Ah, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, that, that that was very, very kind. But so, yeah, we're not going to do it. Um, although that, that one would be pretty fun. King Fallout Sermon would be great. Restoration of Sealing Power and Eternal Marriage, Episode 9. Doctrine Around Section 49, Episode 14. Go Through Mormonism un- Unveiled Affidavits, um, Episode 21. Uh, Simon's Rider, Episode 23. How Garrett and Richard met and became friends. A bonus did, episode. Did, wait, did we ever promise that? Well, I think in the bonus episode, The Man Behind the History, we did. That's that's uh, that's real deep there, Brandon. Um, he's he's citing every episode for each of his claims, so I, I think he's going deep. Yeah. Think, uh, uh, Minor Deming, episode 31, Carthage Conspiracy. Early uh, Missionaries Kicked Out of Kansas, the Can- uh, Curtland Crazies episode. John E. Page Newspaper, uh, The Unpublished Revelations. Pioneer Day, uh, Fourth of July Extravaganza. W.W. Phelps Forgiveness, Polygamy Kind Of. Succession Crisis. Um uh, the Strangite Church, uh, mentioned several times. Rigdon and Partridge feud after much tribulation. More Partridge, Signs of the Times, Kirtland Safety Society, Prosperity, uh, Prosperity Gospel 1 and 2, Zion's Camp, Prosperity Gospel 2 and a half. So uh, then he goes on Boy, to Boy, the real say, question is, why is why is Brandon still listening? Because <laughs> <laughs> we said we're going to get to it. No, everything we promised, we have ponzied. Uh 
as I was doing this, I only put in part of it. He puts in quotes for if I put in everything, I su- <laughs> I suspect that not even the world itself could fit all of the things that have been promised but not delivered. Uh, speaking of deliveries, I have <laughs> greatly enjoyed the mailbag that you read out that you read out of and all of the names the postmaster could be. I am actually a mailman, and so it's been nice to get a little shout out. That's why uh, we we ripped <laughs> Phoebe Draper's name off the mailbag and called it the Brandon Cox. I feel mailbag. like anyone who's a current mail carrier, letter carrier, deserves to have at least one mailbag in yeah. their honor. Um, me being mailman is actually a big reason why I've been able to listen to it as much as I do. I'm able to listen to it various times during work. It's been great that I've been able to be spiritually uplifted even at work. Sometimes the spirit hits me really strong as I'm listening, and I wonder if people think that there is something wrong with me as I'm crying my eyes while delivering their mail. It's very sweet. Very kind. I am so grateful for the time that both of you take to uplift and strengthen others. My testimony has been strengthened by the insights and history that have been shared. I don't think that I have had a deep and abiding love for... uh, I, I don't think that I have had a deep and abiding love for Joseph Smith and all he has done since Truman G. Madsen's talks on the prophet. Yes, they were still going around during my mission in Arizona, 2010 to 2012. Well, he, he, he simply touched a lot of people's lives. So I'm, you were getting it from a better source <laughs> if you were getting that on your mission. No question. We are a, we are a poor substitute the, for that. I, I, I recently told Garrett uh, uh, we, uh, we had um, I had the opportunity to, to share this with Garrett where, uh, where I first came acquainted with those Truman G. Madsen tapes. I was at a Siegel book and tape in Temecula, California on my mission. My zone leader said, hey, you ought to give this a, a listen. So you had church bookstores in your mission we had one in temecula california i think Mm. we might have had one in riverside actually i don't know but uh anyway so uh, a lot of those in wisconsin (laughs) and uh, and so this is actually my favorite part of the email here and don't sell yourself short professor leduc sometimes a good question leads to good answers and you've asked a lot of good questions so you know you can take that Aaron from Tooele <laughs> sometimes I'll be I'll be listening and think wait what about and then you will jump in and ask question ask Garrett the question I had so I appreciate that so what's not known here you can't see is that Garrett has written down a list of 17 questions for me to ask throughout the course of the <laughs> podcast to make him look good that is not true in fact we know that one of the the difficult parts of listening to this podcast is that it's Completely extemporaneous. I mean, we do look up quotes because if I'm quoting Joseph Smith, I don't want to like, like, I don't know, he said something about like being saved or something. And so we do like, we do look up the original source documents when that's what's in question. But frankly, uh, the kind of unplanned nature of it is, is part of, of the, the format of what we do. So he, he does have a question here we'll skip to, uh, but a doctrinal uh, history question I had It may be a good idea for an episode, although I don't know because I'm not a couple of big shot podcasters such as yourselves. (laughs) It's nice to throw some respect on that, Brandon. That's good. Uh, Stems from another podcast I was listening to. It comes from a Christian minister preacher guy. His name is Pastor Mike Faberez. Uh, He had a few episodes named Bad Theology. He was going through... I pray that Lady Gaga introduced that. <laughs> he was going through various religions and how they were, <laughs> and how they were going to hell. I thought, <laughs> I thought it was a fascinating insight into the mind of a Protestant Christian, how he would delve into the history of the religion and then proceed to explain what was wrong with it. He got to an episode about Mormons, and I was like, cool, we made the list. Now I was going to... Now I was... Uh, now... How was I going to burn in hell? Then he proceeds to give a history. All day long. Oh, yeah, seriously. Is <laughs> seriously. I use the term very loosely about the Mormons. It's like he started reading Wikipedia and then decided to go into every anti Mormon site he could find. It was lazy and sloppy. I already feel like my email is super long, so I won't put everything in here that, uh, that he said. But one thing that I thought was interesting. He said something to the effect of, well, the Mormons are wrong because the Bible is God's word and that 
and that they say it has been corrupted. But of course, we know it isn't. He said that they have early documents proving the Bible to be true, even though it's impossible to historically prove miracles. So I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet full stop. However, I do want to know how this pastor could think that the Bible was the unerring word of God. He even brought up how Constantine, I know he's Garrett's favorite person, um, didn't add to or take anything from the Bible in councils of the church. I don't know enough about this topic and was hoping that the two of you would be willing to dip a toe into the waters that are sola scriptura. Your Arizona listener, Brandon. So so first and foremost, Brandon, you're not going to like this answer <laughs> because we are going to cover it in great detail on one of the premium content <laughs> podcasts, the ones that we are forcing people into soup kitchens over, the ones that are causing homes to be foreclosed on by the bank. I mean... Uh, well, so we, we, did, we did hit on... Um, in, in the Joseph Smith and the, in the chronology that, that we want to go from kind of the beginning. Joseph Smith and the Restoration. Joseph Smith and the Restoration. Starting with, with Paul and the apostasy and then going into the great heresies. This was actually going to be the next thing that's going to be coming out in, in March is getting to Constantine. So maybe we'll just give a little bit of a taste yeah. as we give the answer here. So um, a couple of things. So, of course, you know, look, we like to do our research too, um, as haphazard as it is. So we went and researched the uh, this pastor, at least went and listened to several of his sermons, um, and uh, uh, to at least part of the one where he's talking about Mormons. And, and really, I think he did a great job describing it. I mean, it really does seem like he's reading a Wikipedia article, only uh, he, he claims to have access to other books, like, oh, I could give you a list of these other books, other books you could read. While he's listing off other books, he clearly isn't reading any of them, or if he has read them, he's not retaining any of the information in them. And one point in particular that I'd, I'd like to, to demonstrate, because it's part of your question, is he is really hammering to his audience the fact that Mormons are not accepting the Bible as scripture. Um, it, you, you hit the nail on the head with sola scriptura to begin with, that that is exactly how Protestants, especially conservative evangelical Protestants like like himself, that they see the Bible as the inerrant word of God. Now, when you say, you know, how could they possibly see it that way? Well, they would say because that was God's will that it would be inerrant. But it's not enough that Latter-day Saints believe that there is truth outside of the Bible. In fact, this pastor Frankly, I, I mean, look, I, I don't know which it is. Um, at at best, it is not just sloppy, but but utterly wrong. Um, and at worst, he knows he's wrong and is deliberately pushing the buttons of his listeners because he he starts off. Uh, I mean, not doesn't start off, but as he gets into his little tirade, one of the things he says is that Joseph Smith rewrote the Bible. And in fact, the Mormons don't even use the King James Bible. They use the Joseph Smith translation. Now, every Latter-day Saint listening knows that that's not true. In fact, one of the more common questions we get uh, from people, uh, religious educators get, whenever we're talking about the New Testament uh, or the Old Testament, what, why doesn't the church just republish the Bible, the Joseph Smith translation version. That's exactly what happened with the community of Christ. They published the inspired version of the Bible and they used, that was what they used. But we haven't ever done that in part because we didn't have access to the revised version because the, the reorganized church slash community of Christ had possession of it. And so I, I hope he's not doing it deliberately, but he's certainly demonstrating that he does not know what he's talking about at all. The problem is all of his listeners think that he does know what he's talking about. For instance, he says, you know, Joseph Smith goes and he, he writes over 500 new pages of the Bible, which isn't true at all. 
Joseph Smith, the way that they do the the translation, and he makes it sound like it was a secret cabal. He's like they went into back room with all of a, Went into a back room. Joseph and his oh, scribe. Yeah, now you're, yeah, you got your, yeah, you got your voice. Well, I mean, I don't know if that. That's not. I can't really do his voice, but I can do the voice of literally everyone else, and who, who has these kind of arguments. You know, they went in the back room, and nobody knew. No one saw what they were doing, and then Joseph comes back out, and here's his five hundred pages, five hundred new pages of the Bible. Now, look, is there? You, are you okay over there? It's just, it's, yeah, I'm sure that's exactly the way he said it. Well, that's how he wants you to think of Joseph. Now, the, the, the reality is the way that the Bible translation was done is mostly the scribe would copy entire, the entire books of the Bible and only make changes where Joseph said, oh, we should add this or change this. And it was as we talked about in a previous episode, primarily for these clarity reasons. But this pastor told his audience that Joseph Smith created 500 new pages of the Bible. So all of his listeners now believe, not that in the process of copying all of the Bible, you're going to end up copying quite a few pages. Instead, he made it seem as if Joseph Smith wrote out of whole cloth 500 new pages. Now, that's not a nitpicky thing because his argument then, after he makes that claim, he's not just making the claim and then moving on like it's some kind of Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, you know, fan, you know, fact there. It, he says it and then says, and it should make anyone pause that Joseph Smith, you know, created 500 new pages at the very beginning which demonstrates he doesn't have any idea what the Joseph Smith translation is. It, look, all of us talk about things that we're not experts on. Um, no one forced him to give a sermon on what the Mormons really believe. He gave that sermon, bad theology. So, yeah, he he, he gets to be criticized when he's wrong. I think, I think uh, Pastor Mike, like many uh, people that don't, really do a, a deep dive into the theology and the implications of the theology. They're, they seem to be fairly quick to be dismissive of a lot of these things because our belief in Jesus is so different from theirs that that these things are peripheral even. Right. And it doesn't even matter. You don't even have to be that close to being correct because look where you're starting from is so far off which is exactly what he started i mean the biggest thing he had to hang up with was the first vision the fact that and it's funny not the fact that joseph saw god which he he certainly has a problem with he he he's bringing that up don't worry but it's the fact that what the lord told him was that all that joseph shouldn't join any of the churches because all of their creeds were an abomination before him and that is the real trigger. All of them, all of them. Now, again, this demonstrates a lack of understanding of, of this pastor. Look, who's a well-educated man? I mean, he has his degree from Moody Bible College, and then he has a doctorate of divinity as well from Westminster. I mean, he's, he's a very well-educated man. But he is not very well-educated on Latter-day Saint theology, which is the unfortunate thing because he is now the primary purveyor to his listening body of what it is, quote unquote, Mormons really believe. Well, if you're going to do that, then you should probably at least do the justice of actually uh, researching. I don't know. You could, you could possibly, I know this would be a, probably put you on the road to hell, but you might actually have a conversation with a Mormon at some point where you have a conversation with them about what it is that they believe. Because his whole, you know, in his mind, what he's arguing is that if there was no real Christian until the church was reestablished, then that means there's no Christians that are going to be saved all the way back to Paul and Acts and all of that. There was no truth. No one's being saved until the, the Mormon church is restored. And then after that, you know, then people can be saved, but there's only one true church. The problem is he's looking at that claim as a Protestant. He's looking at it as either you're a member of the Church of Christ or you are not. And if you don't have faith in Jesus, 
Welcome to hell, population you. You are not a member of the church, therefore you go to hell. And of course, that's a very hateful idea to him and to, to all other Christians. Like, oh, you're say, so you're saying that if you aren't a Mormon, you, you, you go to hell because they're applying their definition right. of the church of Christ to, to our theology. And it doesn't work very well, mainly because we think everyone's going to heaven. So, at which, he, he, look, he's also going to have a problem with that. <laughs> don't worry. But, but no, Latter-day Saints don't believe that the great Christian reformers and all the Christian believers all throughout the ages are going to hell. We just don't believe they have all of the truth. And their creeds are all an abomination. This, that, that isn't saying that believers are themselves an abomination. It means the creeds that state things like God and Jesus are the same you know, essence, the same, the, the, the Trinitarian theology, that creed, which developed 300 years later, um, is, is not true. Now, that doesn't mean that these people don't believe in God. It doesn't believe, mean that they don't still believe in Jesus. It just means that there are some things that are not true. And, and as we've demonstrated in the premium content that you would be completely unwilling to listen to, Brandon, <laughs> well, you know what? Maybe you can take an extra mail route. If Brandon takes an extra mail route, would he be able to listen to it? You know, I'm going to send it. To, you know, I'm going to send it to Brandon. Wow, I'm going to send it to him for free. Yeah. Next thing you know, people are just going to be knocking on the door. Capitalist yeah, pig, yeah. Richard Leduc, going to yeah. send it to Brandon this for is, free. This is Richard trying to get into Mormon heaven. But um, by by the way, uh, me saying that I'm going to send it for free. There's a long list of things we said we were going to do and we never got to. Yeah, so. you can just add that to the list. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I I think that this is a real good example of where. Assuming that someone else thinks the same thing you do about all of these definitional terms is is a great it, it leads to a great error. Now, I'll give this guy the benefit of the doubt that he just truly doesn't know what he's talking about. But if that's the case, I'd respectfully ask that you stop telling people what it is that we believe. Because I mean, again, you have a doctorate of divinity, so you have you have the ability to find these things out. I don't know why you decided not to find them out, but I do know that what you're teaching is not is not what Latter-day Saints teach. No, Latter-day Saints are not teaching that there were no real Christians and no believers in Jesus until Joseph Smith restored the church. What they're teaching is all of those good people didn't have all of the truth and they didn't have the authority. But you have people like Brigham Young unequivocally stating that men like John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, is going to heaven. Latter-day Saints believe that salvation from hellfire is something that anyone, essentially, who's ever been a Christian is getting. And in fact, the entire world is going to have eventually, even if you suffer for your sins, that you'll eventually go to heaven. There was a separate um, broadcast that he did where the question was, do good people go to hell where he's trying to kind of address this point. And I think it does help to kind of frame where he's coming from and why he would have uh, such a difficult time saying that Mormons are the only ones with all of the truth. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll notice uh, in, this, in this clip that we'll play here that he actually struggles even with the question, it, it, which is a pretty natural question. Do good people go to hell? Uh, he'll, he'll actually start off by saying, well, that's a really weird way to say that. It didn't seem that weird because it's literally the way everyone talks about whether or not good people go to hell. But here's the clip. Pastor Michael, we're talking about sin and God giving people over to their sin and ultimately their destination is hell, which leads to a question that we received. Do good people go to hell? Well, it's a weird uh, and interesting way to word the question uh, because if we're going to speak in absolute terms. The answer is no. Of course, because Jesus made it very clear and the Bible makes it very clear. There are none righteous, no, not one. So no one who's good, really good, righteous is going to hell. Uh, all of us are sinners and we all deserve the punishment of our sins. So in that sense, no. But of course, people don't mean it that way when they say it. They're speaking in relative terms. You know, I know a guy and he's a pretty good guy and he does a lot of good things and he's better than the bad people I see on the 11 o'clock news at night. So, yeah. Um, 
is he going to go to hell? Well, if he rejects Christ, if he does not put his trust in Jesus Christ, the only name given among men by which we must be saved, well, then yes, he will incur the penalty of his sins. And, and as you set this up, I, I do like to think of hell, at least one aspect of it, in terms of what you said there, quoting Romans 1, which we've been studying, and that is that God turns people over to their sin. Now, he does that in this life while giving them common grace and allowing them to enjoy a lot of the goodies and the greatness of what he provides people. But according to Second Thessalonians chapter 1, that's a, a real big aspect of what hell is. People have rejected God, and God then rejects them, which you can see in part with that Romans chapter 1 terminology. He turns them over. But what he does at the end of this life is not only shuts them out from the presence of the Lord, but he shuts them out from the majesty of his power, from the power in providing all the good things that they enjoy. And so in one sense, hell is a place of passive punishment in that if you reject the lifeboat, you know, then you are rejecting salvation and you will incur the independence from that salvation that you so desperately wanted. You want God out of your life? You don't want God to cramp your style? Well, God will step out of your life and he'll step out completely and he'll take all his goodies with him. So as I said, that that first part, he acts almost a little angry at the question. Well, of course, good people don't go to hell because there are no good people. So that makes it very simple. Can't do a good good people don't even go to heaven. There are no good people. So it's it's one of, one of the things that he brings up a couple of times in the clip, and and the reason that I played it is is you know no no doubt that Pastor Mike is loves the Savior and is is a huge obvious fan of the Bible. One of the problems though that he has and the things that he's saying there is he's putting it on the people as an active rejection of God, a rejection of Jesus, a rejection of the lifeboat that God sends to them, but that presupposes that they had, in fact, the opportunity to reject. You reject? Well, then here you go. You're left with your sins. If you're going to throw away God's, you know, you know, then you're going to lose the goodies he's providing you. That's right. Of course, the problem is this it only really seems relevant in Christian nations where there actually is an opportunity for people to hear about the word and then to to make that choice. Although I, I do think if you read some of the theology on their website, it's not entirely clear that he thinks you are choosing it, more that God has chosen to give you the gift of grace. It seems a little bit more Calvinist than that. Um, which, I mean, that, that's not a surprising thing to, to find, that he believes that God has only chosen to give the gift of grace to certain people and that you might reject it. Even if he, even if you're the one choosing to reject it, the question is how do I choose to reject something that I've never heard about? Um, but this, this idea, well, no good people go to hell because there are no good people is really pretty standard fare among, uh, among reform theology and, 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 and other Protestant denominations. It's true the Bible says that there are, you know, they're, they're all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that's not, and, and he, he does clarify, that's not really what the question is asking. The question isn't asking, are we all sinners? Don't we all need the grace of Christ? Because every Christian believes that. The question's really asking, what about my buddy who kind of goes to church on Sundays once in a while and he's a nice guy and he like helped me frame my house and and then one time my car broke down he gave me a ride somewhere but he's never really confessed Jesus i mean he kind of just goes through the motions what happens to that guy and i think he makes it pretty clear well then he goes to hell he goes to hell because he hasn't he hasn't accepted Jesus but the wider implications of that question are what about the people for whom there isn't the Christian missionary knocking on their door every day? Usually you get some kind of a response to, well, you know, the, even natural life demonstrates the glory of God and that, that, you, that you should know God just by walking outside, you should know. That's not really what Paul says when he says, how shall they hear except they be sent? And how the, you know, the, the, the way that you listen to the gospel is someone preaches it to you. And uh, not just because you you walk outside and you know Jesus. Um, 
so I think that's an important an important thing to understand is that in this examination of Latter Day Saint theology, he's approaching it from this belief, this belief that very few people are going to be saved, that none of us deserve to be saved, and that Latter Day Saints are just yet another, uh, uh, you know, heretical group among the the billions of people who who are not going to be saved. Back to his his actual um, statements about the Bible, and you know how how does that Latter Day Saints could believe that that the Bible is, you know, not inerrant. Uh, he certainly makes lots of overstatements about that. At the same time, it's true Latter Day Saints believe that the Bible you know, became corrupted over time. It's something that's even in the Book of Mormon talking about the plain and precious things that have been taken out. There are demonstrable evidences among New Testament scholars of passages that have been added to our current Bible. that They are, frankly, almost beyond dispute in in the the, the circles of of biblical scholars. There are certainly some very, you know, conservative uh, evangelical scholars who, who would dispute them, but things like the addition of the passage on the Trinity um, in the Bible is pretty well understood to not be included in any of the early manuscripts. I, I do think that was part of uh, the question as well. Oh, well, we have early manuscripts that prove that the Bible is correct. I, I'm not quite sure what you're referencing in that regard. We have thousands of fragmentary early manuscripts of especially the New Testament, and they have many, many, many variations. They have additions. They have subtractions. They have words that are left out. They have entire passages that are left out, and scholars generally are, are they're it's a pretty wide consensus that there were changes that were made to the various manuscripts of the Bible before we got them in the form we have them now or the form of their, of their latest version. There is no original biblical manuscript that doesn't exist. I mean, at best you have a copy of 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 a copy and, and keep saying the word copy 30 more times and you're at where you're at for how early our text is. And so I do think, you know, Brandon, you really hit on something very fascinating. Of course you can't prove the miracles of the Bible, which is the whole point of the Bible. The whole point of, of the new Testament isn't that Jesus had some great teachings. First of all, Jesus had some great teachings, but there are lots of people who teach great things. The point of the message in the Gospels is that Jesus died for our sins, was resurrected, and that Jesus is the Son of God. How do you prove that? Oh, look, I have an early Greek manuscript. That shows that Jesus somehow suffered for my sins. It wouldn't prove anything. It would simply prove that early followers believe that, which, of course, Latter-day Saints believe. And I think the dismissive nature in which he casts aside Latter Day Saint, um, Latter Day Saint claims to miracles. I mean, he almost spits out of his mouth the fact that angels are appearing to Joseph Smith. Well, angels are appearing to Paul. Doesn't seem to have a problem with that, right? Angels are angels are uh, appearing to to Peter. No, no real issues there. I mean, the idea that an angel can appear to someone is actually not a problem. For this pastor. The idea that an angel could appear to someone outside of what's recorded in the Bible is the problem. And that's, frankly, many criticisms of Latter-day Saints coming from evangelical pastors. Uh, they, it, it, it's what you would call a, a tautological argument. Latter-day Saints are preaching something that's not in the Bible. Well, all truth can only be found in the Bible. Well, Latter-day Saints are teaching something that's not in the Bible. Well, therefore, it can't be true. Because when you start with the premise that all truth is only in the Bible, well, then, yeah, pretty quickly, Latter-day Saints aren't teaching that. They love the Bible. Latter-day Saints believe in the Bible. 
but they also believe in the Book of Mormon. They also believe in in other revelations, which, by the way, he did a terrible job with that. He was he did appear to be reading some kind of chronology, like he talks about the Book of Commandments being published, and then I think without realizing it, thinks that the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants is the same thing as the later 1876 Doctrine and Covenants. So he talks about how the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, you know, institutes polygamy. Except, of course, it doesn't. You know, DNC 132 is not in there. So, so what would you say, though, too? Because when, when he starts his, uh, you know, his, his talk on Mormonism generally, um, he, he's, he's coming at it, f- it seems like he feels more justified in the attack because Mormons or Latter day Saints attack him first. Not just with the creeds, yeah. but with this is the only true church. Well, I mean, he, he certainly demonstrates a lack of, of respect. I mean, look, I know it makes people feel better about the fact that Joseph Smith was murdered to call it a shootout in a jail. But you at least owe your listeners the respect of explaining what actually happened. Uh, this isn't like a, a saloon in the Wild West and they're fighting over a card game. There's 100 to 200 people with guns violating the law, breaking into a jail, and already having murdered a person. A, a gunfight? N- no, no. Someone was already dead before there was even any conversation about shooting back. But I feel like he feels attacked that we're saying that we're the only true church, that we're the only sure. true Christians. And, and, and he this, starts there. This is something that Joseph is, is going to deal with in his life as well. And, and it's, it, it's certainly in part because Protestants have to make this argument early and often. When Martin Luther is, is you know, given the size 15 from you know, from the Pope and, and, and kicked out down the door. Um, of course, Catholics are going to claim that, that Luther, Luther, Lutherans, um, Zwinglians, uh, you know, all of these other, you know, Anabaptist groups that are going to start forming and eventually reform theology, Christians, Calvinists. The, the claim is going to be made by Catholics. Well, it, look, that's nice that you... <laughs> It's nice that you don't agree with, you know, indulgences, but you don't have any authority. You, you know, we have authority back to Peter. Peter gave authority to the, the, the Bishop of Rome, and that authority was passed on. That's great that you're claiming the Bible has authority, but you, you, you don't have any authority. You've been excommunicated. That authority was taken from you. And so Protestants develop and they will embellish upon this idea that authority comes from belief. Now that matters. You're thinking, well, you're not really answering the question. No, Brandon, I'm not. But <laughs> second of all, it's a roundabout way of answering the question because it's, it's essential to the, to the actual answer of the question. Protestants are going to argue that belief gives authority. Now, now that means that I don't have to have a Catholic priest who has hands on head, lineal descent back to Peter to baptize me, because as long as I believe, I ha- I am part of this community of Christians that Luther and others are going to argue has always existed. Because if all you have to have is a belief that you're saved by the grace of Jesus— then sure, there's a whole bunch of Catholics back in the early three and four and five hundreds who wrongfully think that they also have to have faith in Jesus and their baptism by a priest, but they still have they still have faith in Jesus, right? So they're maybe unknowingly part of what the real Church of Christ is, and the real Church of Christ is just any community of believers of faith in Jesus. So they 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 definitionally change the meaning of of church. They 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 the the Roman Catholic Church is called that because Catholic means universal. The Catholic Church claimed it was universal because it was the church that was founded by Jesus and it was the one that had the authority to perform the ordinances and rites as laid down by Jesus and the apostles. 
that's why it's universal. It's it's the church. It's the it, it is the universal church. Now you put the Roman in there because it's it's following the Roman pontiff. Well, these Protestant reformers are going to argue, no, 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 no. The church is what constitutes any body of believers. So the reason why these people in the early church are saved isn't because they were baptized by a Roman, a Roman ordained pontiff, you know, it, it's because they believed. And so it's a real definitional issue here. What, what he's really reacting to is essentially the Latter-day Saints have, a, have an exclusionary claim. They do. Latter-day Saints do. And, and, and sometimes it makes Latter-day Saints feel very uncomfortable. But it is part of Latter-day Saint theology that Joseph Smith is teaching that this, well, the Lord is giving Joseph Smith a revelation that says that this is the only true and living church. Now, that does not mean that there's not truth in every other church. It certainly doesn't mean that Joseph doesn't believe that there's good in every other church. You don't have to read very much of Joseph Smith to know that even though he's being wildly persecuted, he believes that there's goodness and truth among other Christians. Brigham Young repeats that over and over and over again, believing that there's good and, and, and truth among other Christians. You're right that he feels like he's on the defensive, but he's on the defensive because of a fundamental principle of Protestantism. This idea that there is something that you have to join as a part of salvation, that there's some ordinance that has to be performed, strikes at the heart of every Protestant group that that from all the way back to Luther. Um, and so he kind of, he he, he certainly straw man's Latter Day Saint belief there by saying, "Oh, oh, so so there's nobody saved till Joseph Smith had his revelation." Well, if you'd read any of those revelations, you'd know that in fact, yeah, all of them are. In fact, everybody, because to a Christian, what is salvation? It's salvation from hellfire, from eternal hellfire, and Latter Day Saints don't believe in eternal hellfire. Which he could read about in the Pearl of Great Price that he so quickly casts aside. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, one of the things that he does, and again, I, I, I get it. Look, do I make mistakes speaking? Of course I do. I mean, frankly, Brandon just gave us a litany of things that I said I would talk about someday that I'm obviously never going to talk about. So you could easily point to that as mistakes. When you're talking extemporaneously, you're going to make mistakes. But this is not simply a mistake. You deliberately decided to portray Joseph Smith's murder as if it was some kind of a shootout. They, they also portray what happens in the deaths in Missouri as a consequence of their rabble-rousing yeah. and polygamy. Well, yeah, that, that, of course the violence is going to happen to them in Missouri because of polygamy, even though none of the perpetrators of that violence are claiming that it has anything to do with polygamy. But don't worry, Pastor Mike just happens to know. He doesn't happen to know because he read a document. He doesn't happen to know because he read a book. Although he keeps saying things like, oh, there's lots of books you can read on this. If there are lots of books you can read on this, you may want to try reading them. Um, because uh, you... I have no doubt that there's lots of books that, that exactly. say that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very similar to my... <laughs> My exchange that I had the one time with the guy who came to the fireside, very angry. Uh, uh, look, sometimes you go to firesides and there's people that aren't happy that you're there. Um, actually, I think Most everyone's them, yeah. always yeah. unhappy. No one's we happy thought, to We go thought to we were getting fireside. Hank Smith or John, by the way. Yeah, we got, we got yeah. this guy. I mean, it is pretty funny. You know how how disappointed everyone is. Oh, really? Who did you get as a speaker? Like, oh, it's a historian. Huh? huh. That'll be. Maybe we'll talk about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. That'll be great. Whew. I hope we can talk about townships in there. You know, why is my fireside speaking circuit not filled up? <laughs> Nobody knows. I mean, my, my fireside speaking skills are clearly so bad, Richard... Richard's ward canceled it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, not yeah. even Richard could get me on the. On, on. It is. It is actually funny. So my son, uh, you know, on his mission, they had John. By the way, come and speak in a in a fireside for his 
missionaries. And everyone was really, really excited. John, by the way's daughter is apparently serving in, in Barcelona, Spain. It was fantastic. And so my son's like, hey, you know, I, I have this friend. Yeah. Does, anyone, my- does anyone want Garrett <laughs> Dirkbot to come speak? And, and you can hear crickets. audible crickets. They don't even have crickets in Spain like the ones we have oh, in America, but they, they, they my brought them in. sweet, sweet son with his best of intentions, yeah. and no one wants it. Yeah. Everyone was like, uh, so he's does, like, does, a, does, he, does he know John, by the way? Yeah, yeah. Is there any way he could play us a clip of Hank Smith speaking? <laughs> because then it might be good. Um, but I, you know, one time I had this guy come up after a fireside who was very adamant um, that he had read something a particular aspect of, of uh, something in, in one of the Joseph Smith Papers volumes. And he said, you know, no, I, I know I read that in a Joseph Smith Papers volume. And, and I said, well, well, you didn't read that in a Joseph Smith Papers volume. And he's like, no, I did. I read it. I mean, it's in there. And he, he, he persisted a little bit. And I was trying to be kind at first, but then he actually started to become more agitated. And, well, I, 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 stopped, I stopped being... Uh, as kind probably so maybe I need to go back to the uh, to the uh, Sermon on the Mount but I just said I just said um, I know that you didn't read it in the Joseph Papers volume because the volume that it would be in is the one that I wrote and it's not in there and to which he's shock and horror he's like well one I mean I know I read it somewhere yeah I have no doubt that you read it somewhere um, probably on a subreddit but um it is a little frustrating. I mean, look, I, I want to give grace to this guy. You know, he's obviously a good man and trying to lead people to Jesus. But that doesn't change the fact that he is uh, not just attacking our truth claims. I understand that our religion is considered false by other Christians. I get it. I get it that we believe something that they don't believe. That's why I believe it. Because it's different than what they believe. Because I don't want to believe in a God who's sending almost everyone to hell. So that's why I believe this one. Because Joseph Smith's a prophet. But at least be honest about what it is we believe. Why, why in the world are you telling your followers that Joseph Smith added 500 pages to the Bible? Would, wouldn't it be sufficient just to say that Joseph Smith thought he could receive revelation that would provide insight into the Bible? That's enough to make all your followers follow. You yeah, don't have to lie about that. There's plenty of room to say Joseph's burning in the fires of hell because he changed yeah. the Bible. And, and as Richard's always fond of pointing out, he couldn't get to polygamy fast enough. And, and you know, he, he's trying to bring it up. Oh, yeah, because they're just practicing polygamy all the time in 1835. Well, what do you, what do you mean? Oh, we've got all kinds of sources on that. By all kinds, you mean ones that aren't dated that we don't know, I guess, because we don't have any 1835 dated sources on plural marriage. Uh, but thank you for letting me know. You know what? I'm going to go back and research now because now I know that he saw it. Um, and that's the reason why I feel like it might be a bit disingenuous because you know that the thing that's going to cause your listeners, the most horror is A, a belief that Joseph can rewrite the Bible and B, polygamy. So, so what do you, what do you do? Oh, that, that's what I'm going to spend my time. Play the hits. And, and, and if you're going to do that, look, Latter-day Saints did practice plural marriage. There are many books that are written about it. Maybe you could read one of them and then you would know that Mormons aren't being exterminated in Missouri because they're practicing polygamy. And maybe you should read some of those accounts, Pastor. Maybe you should read Amanda Barnes Smith account of her husband being murdered and her 10 year old son being slaughtered. Because that, you know, they just had it coming, right? If only they were following the correct Jesus, then 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 that wouldn't have happened. I don't believe in a God that thinks that the murder of 10-year-olds is justified by heresy. I know that you do. And that's a very, very great difference between the two of us. We don't believe that God is actively sending anyone to hell. Yeah, he gives them choice and he actually gives them the ability. One of the great revelations that Joseph Smith received is that 
and also found in the Book of Mormon that we believe men are going to be judged for their own sins. Now that is strikes at the heart of Christian theology. I know that it does because the most essential aspect of reform theology is the complete and total depravity of man. And Latter-day Saints don't believe it. We believe because of these revelations that when God says, for God so loved the world that is that he that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life that God actually means it there's no point in giving that only begotten son if only this bare fraction of a minority ever even got a chance to hear it accept it and believe it we agree with you that you have to have faith in Jesus ultimately, to be exalted. But you made the mistake of thinking our word exalted is the same thing as your word saved. And they're not. You could ask a Latter-day Saint about that, and they would inform you that they're not the same thing. Well, I guess it depends on which Latter-day Saint you ask, but if you go talk to someone who understands the theology, they would tell you. We believe that everyone will eventually be saved from hellfire, and they will be... uh, they will be eventually, after suffering for their sins, they are all going to be resurrected and they'll go to the at least the celestial kingdom, which is this kingdom of bliss, a kingdom of happiness, a kingdom of heaven very similar in description to what Christians talk about heaven being. And that yet there's another heaven above that, which is the, ter- the, the, the terrestrial kingdom. And that there's an exaltation above that. In order to have exaltation... Latter-day Saints do believe that people, all people, will eventually have to be baptized by proper authority, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then receive temple covenants. But unlike other Christians, Latter-day Saints believe that literally everyone who has ever lived on this earth is going to have an equal opportunity, not just at that salvation, because that salvation is coming regardless, but at that exaltation as they make choices, because we believe in, in work for the dead. We believe that for God to be just, God had to provide a way for literally everyone to have a chance at exaltation. And and frankly, um, I think that's an important thing to consider. when When Christians are disputing with Latter-day Saints, One of the Latter-day Saints, one of their biggest places to go to is this idea of universal salvation and universal opportunity at exaltation. In a world that is very concerned with how equal opportunity is, it's Latter-day Saints that say God is truly no respecter of persons. He is not sending people to the depths of a fiery hell because their parents just so happen to be atheists, because they were born in 600 AD, you know, China, and didn't even hear the word Jesus. We believe God is going to provide a means whereby everyone, everyone has the opportunity to be exalted. That doesn't mean they'll all choose that, but we're going to at least give them the choice. That's one of the best parts of, of the revelations that Joseph received that, unfortunately, he, like many other pastors, cast aside. Look, our Christian friends are, are some of the great lights of the world. I mean, there is more service done by Christians in this world than could ever possibly be accounted for. Talk about the books of this world not being able to cover them. The kind Christian acts that are performed every day by people who believe that Jesus is the Lord. We join with them in that. Many times they don't really want our fellowship, but we can still extend a hand of love to those people. Yes, it does get my dander up a little bit when someone claims that I believe something that I don't believe or maligns the history of the prophet Joseph Smith. But I think a a real takeaway for all of this is in a world filled with so much sin, in a world filled with so much darkness, 
we should grab a hold of those Christians who are around us and say, I know you don't believe what I believe, but let's at least try to do something good. So thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you for listening to the Standard of Truth podcast, hosted by historian Dr. Garrett Dirkmott. If you know anybody that could benefit from the material in this episode, please share it with them. And for more resources, visit standardoftruth.com. Until next time.